All right. Woo, that was a beautiful song. Amen. How you guys doing? All right. Ready for the word of God? Okay. Hi, Grandma. Did you drive? Okay. You're awesome, Grandma. Awesome. Amen. All right. So today, uh, usually I just let the person come up. And today, I just want to say something about the person that's coming up to, to share the word um, this morning with you. And we know it's all the Lord, absolutely. But uh, this person has grown to be such a, a man of God. And um, just very blessed to, to, uh, to see and witness, you know, uh, what God has done in his own life. And that is my son, Kelly E. So would you welcome him this morning? Come on, give him a big God bless you. Come on, give it up. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Feels so good. Feel so good about myself. Um, <laughs> you know, I love that Pastor Davey was talking about, um, you know, just how blessed you really are. And I don't know, this just came to my mind this morning, but um, I'm about to tell you how really blessed we are right now. Number one, we're in church. Number two, our church is in Hawaii. And number three, our church is on a golf course in Hawaii. Like, that's crazy. Um, anyways, I, I told a, a friend that from the mainland um, a little while ago. And I don't know, when I was talking to him, I was just like, it was like no big deal. Yeah, all right, our church moved around and we're on a golf course now. And he's like, what? Golf course and you're in Hawaii? I was like, yeah, that's true. That's crazy. Like, how many churches can say that? Anyways, we're super blessed. Um, We're at uh, the end of a series right now, and it's called Journey to the Center of the Heart. And um, today's going to be a little bit different. It's going to kind of take a different journey, a different path. Um, so I guess we're kind of going to kind of close the series early. But I will say that, um, you know, I hope and I pray that today's message is going to encourage us to go deeper to go deeper into our own hearts and to really take that journey to see um, what really lies beneath all the surface level stuff. Amen? Amen. All right. So there's this really interesting passage of scripture and it's where we're going to start. It's in um, John, the gospel of John, uh, first chapter. And if you're like me, um, You've read through this a lot, you know, you've, you've heard it preached to you a lot, and you've gone through it, and you've kind of breezed through it a lot, and um, I've actually kind of really come to love this particular um, piece of scripture, um, so I would encourage you to take a fresh look at it if you haven't, um, John chapter 1, but the reason why I like it so much is because it's basically the story of us and God on a single page. It's basically the story of us from the beginning, from creation, all the way to salvation. And the way that John lays it out is really cool and interesting, actually, when you really focus in on it and you look at what he's saying and the words that he is using. So we're going to begin there, John chapter 1, and we're going to focus in just on the beginning of the first chapter of John. This is what it says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now John opens up his story, and he takes us back, way back, to the beginning. And we need to understand what that word means, beginning. It means there isn't anything. No earth, no creation, no culture. 
No preconceptions, no you, no me, just God. Just the word, which we understand to be Jesus Christ, existing there with the Father at the beginning before anything was created. And from this, from God and Jesus and a completely blank slate, if we look at verse 3, all things were made through him, and without him, not anything made that was made. Verse 3, creation comes onto the scene. Creation is, comes out of God, the only thing that existed for eternity. So now at this point in John's story, we have God, the eternal existing God, and the word Jesus, and we have creation, which came from him. And then the crucial part of the story comes. And it's crucial because it is the point where the creator meets his creation in a way that has never happened before since eternity passed. It's never happened before. And it's the point in the story where the trajectory of our destiny changes. It's the point when God comes as a man, Jesus made flesh. And in that crucial moment in his story, the thing that stood out to me, if we look at what he's saying, the way that John chooses to describe that moment, the first relationship that he chooses to point to is this, verse 4. It says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. From the very beginning to creation, to God meeting his creation, the first thing he says is, Jesus is the light of men. Now, he could have said a lot of different things. He could have said Jesus was the king of men. He could have said uh, Jesus is the savior of men, both of which would have been true, right? But he chooses the light of men. And if we believe what the Bible says about itself, that the scriptures are inspired by God, that the individual words of scripture come from God, then that begs the question, why would John choose to use this description in his story? Why does he choose to call, to call Jesus the light of men? And if we continue on, we can see that he actually becomes pretty enamored with this idea of light because he doesn't stop there. In verse 5, it says, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Now, this is a different John. This is John the Baptist. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. So at the outset of John's story, his account of how the world began, there's this idea of light. And if we actually zoom out and we look at the Bible as a whole, the Gospel of John uses that word, light. The Greek word is phos. I believe that's how you pronounce it. He uses it more than twice as much than any other of the Gospel writers, so more than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So this is like his deal, the light. And not only in the Gospel of John, but in the other books that also bear his name, 1 John, for instance. 1 John also uses this word light to describe Jesus uh, very extensively. So if you look on your bulletin at the very top, the title of the message is Light and Darkness. And the reason why it's called that is because our goal today is that we're going to take that metaphor, light of men, and we're just going to pick it apart for all that it's worth, and we're going to just dig in and see what we can find out 
um, what that really means. What does that mean for us that he's the light of men? What does that mean on a practical level when we're living our day-to-day -day lives? And there's not only light, but of course, there's always the absence of light, darkness. So we're going to talk about that as well. We're going to examine the opposite and really explain why light is much better than darkness. Now, if you look at the next scripture, we fast forward about two chapters in your Bible, in the book of John, but about 30 years in real time, about 30 years later after the light of men first came into the world. And now we see Jesus, he's a grown man, probably around 30 or so years old. And we see him and he is convened in a secret meeting. And he's in a secret meeting with a man named Nicodemus. Now Nicodemus was a Pharisee, but he wasn't only just a Pharisee, um, but he was on the Jewish ruling council. So basically he was a politician. And like any politician worth his salt, he made very, very calculated steps as to who he associated with and who he steered away from. And Jesus being the controversial guy that he was in his day, if you didn't know that, he was actually very controversial. He stirred up a lot of things. Um, Jesus was certainly someone that Nicodemus would want to stay away from because he was a counterculture kind of guy. He went against the natural order. But like a lot of people in Jesus' day, um, Nicodemus' intrigue, his curiosity got the best of him. So one night Nicodemus conspires to meet Jesus in the middle of the night so no one can see, no one's around to ask him some questions. And that's where we enter in, into this scene, John 3, 19. Jesus says to Nicodemus, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Now, essentially, Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, look, Nicodemus, I know who you are. I know what you do. I know that you know the law. You know all the complexities of the law and the nuances of the law and all its complications. And I know that you could talk to me about that. So let me put this in your language very simply. This is the verdict. This is the verdict. And he says, the verdict is that light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead. Now, at this point in John's story of what's happening we have a problem. We're introduced to this problem that although the light of man has met creation in an amazing way, people still loved darkness. And that's a big problem. And what that means for us is that light or coming into the light or meeting, standing in the light of men, Jesus, is a choice on our part. It is a choice that may initially go against our natural tendencies, our tendencies to want to remain in the shadows, in the darkness. And it's important for us to keep that in mind, that coming into the light may be initially unnatural. So what then makes people afraid of the light? You know, when I was going through this, I was thinking, that's a peculiar thought because we're all familiar with people who are afraid of the dark. We're all familiar with, you know, little kids, and I think many of us have experienced that too, you know, afraid of the dark. And even me, these days, you know, when I'm walking by myself in the dark, you know, I'm definitely keeping an eye over my shoulder. But what would make people afraid of the light? Well, Jesus continues on and he says, everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Point number one on your notes, the first attribute of light is that light exposes. 
light exposes, but darkness gives a false sense of security. Jesus is the light of man because when you turn that on like a light switch, it exposes everything. It illuminates everything just as when you turn on a light in a room, it does expose everything in that room and it illuminates everything in that room. That's the way it works with Jesus. And there is a fear of being exposed. There is a fear that our evil deeds, that our sin essentially is going to be exposed. So at this point, I think this, you know, metaphor, if you're not really into metaphors, well, right now it's becoming very practical for all of us. Being in the light means you are willing to be open to God. You are willing to be exposed. You're willing to confess your mistakes and your sin. But darkness means hiding it. That means keeping it to yourself, not confessing to your brothers and sisters around, around you, not confessing it to God. So the primary way that we transition from darkness to light, according to the scripture, is to get rid of that pride, to get rid of that fear, and willingly expose who we are, expose our mistakes to God. Let's move on to the next scripture, 1 John chapter 1, 5 through 9. So now we're in the other book that John wrote, and this is the very beginning as well. And he says this, This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light. There it is again. And in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So this is telling us something else now about how the light operates, how the light of men operates. And if you focus in on verse 6 and 7, it says, If we say we have fellowship with him, God, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And if we stop there, this is telling us that light means fellowship. That's point number two on your outline. Light means fellowship, and its opposite, darkness, is isolation. When you're sitting in darkness because you think that you're safe there for hiding your life, hiding your past, hiding your sin, whatever it is, it's the false sense of security. Remember, we went over that. It's a false sense of security. It's not real. And the reason why it's not real is because that isolates you from the only power that can save you, God. When you choose to remain in darkness, that isolates you from God, the only power who can save you. And not only that, but it says that when we walk into the light, we have fellowship with one another which then means if we remain in darkness, you also isolate yourself from the people around you that can help you. You isolate yourself from all of the people who are waiting to pray for you, to encourage you, and that's why it is a false sense of security. There's nothing secure about it, actually. And once we come into the light, man, it's a beautiful thing. And I think many of us have experienced that when we have something weighing heavy on our hearts and we 
bring it into the light of Christ and we confess it to him and we confess it to one another, something amazing happens and we can see each other. Now we're all in the light and we can see each other and we can say, I know where you're at. You know where I'm at. Let's help each other. You see, you can't do that when you're in darkness because you can't see anything. And I think that's what it's meant in this sense that Jesus is the light of men. How many of you are, got, are, are you going through um, Celebrate Recovery? Anybody? All right. All my broken people. Awesome. <laughs> um, I just want to talk to you guys for a second because Celebrate Recovery is is an amazing thing, but, I, but it might not be something that you expected it to be. <laughs> Celebrate recovery, um, you know, if you don't learn anything uh, more about God or Jesus or the Bible than you did before, you know, I think it's kind of okay, but th- the principle of that program And what we do there, basically all it is, is one huge step into that light. It's one huge step out of the darkness by confessing to God and by by doing that in the fellowship of other people. And for those of you who aren't in the program, that's literally all we do. Like there's no, oh yeah, that was hard. Let me give you my advice. We're actually not even allowed to give advice. We're just there to have fellowship and to just come into the light together and just to be real. And that's all it is. So I would encourage you, kind of side note, but if you're in that and you're kind of getting discouraged, I would encourage you to stick with it. You know, even if you're like, I'm not learning anything new. I'm just here sharing about my past and blah, blah, blah. This is a biblical thing, and it's going to do amazing things for your life um, if you stick with it and if you take it seriously. Second part of verse 7, so not only do we have fellowship with one another, but the second part of verse 7 says, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Forgiveness is received in the light. That's the sub point under number two. Forgiveness is received in the light. It's only in a state of confession, of exposing yourself, that forgiveness can do its full work in you. It's only in that light where you can experience the true freedom of God's forgiveness. You're not going to experience that if you remain in darkness. And perhaps this is obvious to you, but something that was really encouraging to me is that walking in the light does not mean being perfect. That's great news. (laughs) That's great news for me because if you go through the Bible, it tells you to walk in the light a lot. Walking in the light does not mean being perfect, but what it does mean is that it is the only way that we're going to be put right again with God. It's only in the light that we're able to do that. How are we doing so far? Everyone tracking? Awesome. So to recap, the light of man came into the world the first time that God collided with his creation. John describes it as he is our light. And by light of men, it's not just males, it's mankind. So the light of everyone And we see that from sort of a functional standpoint. The metaphor is similar in that how light exposes things, Jesus exposes everything. And that, in fact, it's impossible for you to get close to him without being willing to be exposed. Just think about how crazy would be if you said, I'm going to go into this room that the light is on in, but I don't want the light to be on me. It just doesn't work. It doesn't work that way. And not only does it expose, but it 
brings us into fellowship with one another. We come into the light where we can see one another and we understand what is happening around us. It brings us in fellowship with each other, with people who can help us, and it allows us to receive forgiveness from God. Now, if we jump to the next scripture, we're back in John's other book now, the Gospel of John. John 8, 12 says this, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. I want to draw your attention to that phrase that we are continuously walking in this life and there's two choices, walking in darkness or walking in light. Furthermore, in John 12, it says, so Jesus said to them, the light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. A third attribute of this light, the light of Christ, is that it gives us direction. Light gives us direction, and its opposite, darkness, leaves us disoriented. One of the great Christian writers, C.S. Lewis, said this, and I think it, it really puts it into perspective. He said, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. You see, the light of Christ is a guiding light. By that light, we can see everything else. It gives us direction. It gives us a sense of where we stand in reference to everything else. It measures how good we're doing or how not so good we're doing, how close we are to what God wants or how far away we are. The light allows us to see what's around us. It allows us to see the obstacles around us. It becomes our compass in a sense. There's a moment in my life personally when I sort of realized this, and I want to share a little bit about it, but um, how many of you have a friend in your life that basically can do everything and does it really well? Anybody? Yeah. Okay, so I have a friend like that. He basically does everything. Um, He's a friend from uh, school. I went to school in Washington, so that's where I met him. But the guy is super intelligent, super smart. Um, He's in dental school right now. So, and he like passed with flying colors his his entrance exam. And you would think being that kind of person, you know, he would just be cooped up, like studying all day or something like that. But nope, somehow he, he finds a way to learn how to rock climb and he mountain bikes. And he taught me some like mixed martial arts stuff when we were in college. And like, and what else is there? Yeah, he hikes, just all kinds of crazy stuff. I mean, he's just a pretty, like, overall outdoorsman, studly kind of guy. But anyways, oh, and to top it off, the best thing is that he's a total, like, brother in Christ at the same time. So, pretty awesome. And um, he's married already, if you're wondering, so sorry, ladies. But um, anyways, I went to visit him. Um, for a couple of weeks, about three years ago, I think it was. And, uh, and he lives in Oregon. Um, that's where his family's from. So uh, I flew there, and we just spent a week together just hanging out, um, you know, basically just me tagging along on all his crazy adventures, you know, mountain biking, 
rock climbing, first time I ever rock climbed in my life, hanging off the side of a cliff, you know, all these things. Um, we hiked this mountain, got up at three in the morning and started so that we could watch the sunrise at the top. The whole hike took like eight hours round trip. It was crazy. But anyways, there's this, there's this one time when I was there when we decided to hike down into this cave um, that neither of us have ever been in. I haven't been in, but he actually hasn't been in there either. So we're like looking it up online like, oh, yeah, which cave should we go to? And it's like, oh, yeah, this one looks okay. So we're like driving there. And it's in the middle of nowhere, of course. And we're driving and we think we come upon it, so we're like, okay, let's get out. And we're like, oh, okay, that must be it. And um, I actually took some photos when I was there, so I have some of them to kind of just illustrate a little more. But if you can see, that's, that's outside the cave. Um, that's the entrance, so you can kind of get a sense of the scale of that thing. And, um, you know, I was really excited. You can keep it right there. I was really excited until I saw this until I saw that the entrance of the cave looked like the jaws of the earth, basically. So we get there, and I'm seeing this. I'm like, that thing looks like it wants to eat me. It's like, I don't know if I want to go in there. But, you know, being the fearless guy that my friend is, he's like, come on, let's do it, let's do it. So it's like, okay. So anyways, we go in there, right? And there's still some ambient light, you know, when you first enter in. And we walk in there about 100 yards, and we come to a point where it looks like there was like a huge rock slide because there's like this huge pile of rocks like at the back of the cave and there's like, it looks like there was like a metal fence and the metal fence just got messed up. It just got mangled. There's like pieces of metal sticking up out of the rocks. And so we're in there about 100 yards in. And I'm like, well, I guess that's it. Let's go. And I'm like walking back. I'm like, man, that was exciting. Like, I'm, I, feel, I feel alive. And of course, my friend... You know, being the guy that he, he is, he's like, no, there's a way. There's a way. And he's like on his hands and knees and he's looking for like some way through the pile of rocks. I'm like, dude, there's no, like, that's it. Can't you see there's a fence that's most, supposed to keep people out? And then like the rocks collapsed on the fence. Probably means we shouldn't go in there. But anyways, soon enough, he does find a way. He does find a way. Um, actually, you can just keep it. Yeah. But um, we get there, and um, we find this, like, little crawl space. Basically, it's only enough, like, height for you to lay on your belly and, like, scoot your way through. And I'm like, man, are you serious? And he's like, he's like yeah, we're doing this thing. And I was like, okay. And the thing about the, the crawl space is that it's not big enough for us to fit our backpacks in. So we have backpacks on. And he's like, we got to leave the bags. I was like, uh, you mean the bags with like our food and water in it? <laughs> it's like, yeah. It's like, it's not going to fit. And it didn't. So we're like, okay. So we have our bags. And in your opinion, out of all the gear that we have, what do you think would be the one thing to bring into? Flashlight. Exactly. <laughs> Flashlight. Water. Who said that? Come on. I'm just kidding. Um, flashlights so we take out all the flashlights and we were prepared with the flashlights for sure like we had the headlamps we had like the handheld flashlights we had backups for the flashlights we had batteries in case the flashlights died and then we had backups for the backups of flashlights because when you're in that place you don't want to be without a flashlight okay so we take the flashlights out and we're like crawling crawling through there and there's one the first crawl space goes straight i think that might be it but it goes straight across the ground. And then we come to a part where there's another crawl space, but it goes vertically, straight up. So then we crawl through the vertical one, and it opens up into this huge, huge cavern. So we're like on floor number two of this cave, the man-eating cave. And we get up there, and by this point, because we came through the two crawl spaces that were like shaped like an L, right? So there is no ambient light anymore. Nothing. You know, and of course, for fun, my friend's like, hey, let's turn off our lights. Yeah. It's like, okay. So you turn it off and it's just like, it's the, I've never experienced this kind of darkness before. 
but it's 0% light. You know how when you're usually in the dark and your eyes kind of adjust and like, okay, I can see now. This does not happen in this cave. <laughs> it's dark and your eyes will not adjust. So we get in there and we turn on the lights and um, we're walking around and we, you know, kind of explored a little bit and it was cool and um, <clears throat> saw some ice crystals, which was kind of cool. But the thing that I noticed was someone, if you can see on this picture, someone spray painted these bright orange arrows um, in certain areas so that you could find your way out. If you go to the next picture, you'll see another um, one. There's another one. See, that's the vertical part that I was talking about. That's him going back down into it so we can get out of the, get out of the place. Um, but someone spray painted these arrows, and I remember being in there, and I remember coming to my mind all those scriptures that talk about without Christ, we're really in darkness. And like in that scripture in 1 John, it says that God is light and in him is no darkness at all, which means that it's that kind of darkness that we're in. Not the kind that your eyes eventually adjust. It's darkness where if your light was to go out, you are absolutely hopeless and lost. And I remember being in there and it was just hitting me like crazy. I was like, man, it was like a, it was like a Bible principle that all of a sudden was like a sensory experience in real life, you know, and it hit me really heavy and I was like, man, that's amazing. Like these lights are so precious in here because I'm telling you, once we got to that place, because the exit is so small, if we lost our lights, I would say that there'd be no way we'd make it out. Absolutely no way. Even if you tried to feel your way around, but thanks to the lights, we could see the directions. We could see the arrows. And the reason why I'm telling you this <laughs> is because I think a lot of us often wonder, where are the arrows? Where's the direction? I don't know what to do. I keep tripping over the same thing over and over again. And you start to question God and if he's real, and if he really gives you direction, and I'm not trying to judge anyone, but I think at least one thing to consider is that perhaps the arrows are actually there. Perhaps they're all around you, but you're just sitting in darkness. Maybe it's going to take something on your part to see the direction that he wants you to move in. When you turn off the light, it doesn't make the arrows go away. They're still there. You just can't see them. And I think that's what it's like for us sometimes. We have to turn on that light again, or we have to step into the light, which, again, remember we talked about the primary way of us stepping into the light is being open to being exposed by God. It means confessing to God and to one another. So I would encourage you, to do that if you feel lost. So what do we do then at this point? We're just going to let God's word speak to us in this moment and just follow along with me with this next scripture. It's underneath the heading of the call because I really feel like this is a calling for all of us. It says, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness but instead expose them there's that word expose them for it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret but when anything is exposed by the light 
it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Amen? That's a huge amen. Wake up, come out from the dark, and Christ will shine on you. And I just want to just hit that scripture hard because it's, it's, there's so much good stuff in it. It says that, yes, you were once in darkness, but now you're in light. We've come out of the darkness. And we're being called not to go back there. We're being called to get rid of those evil actions or the sin as best as we can to try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. That's what it says. And instead of taking part in the works of darkness, expose them. Which is, I know, a hard thing. And I know it can be a scary thing. But let's just take this promise in the Bible seriously when it says, when we step into the light, we become visible. And the Christ, and Christ will shine on you. The light of man will shine on you. That same light of man that collided with his creation a long time ago. The same one that gives light to everyone, the same light that exposes everything, and the same light that gives us direction, that light, Christ, will shine on you. Why don't we just close our eyes for a second and let's just get before God um, to go back to the sermon series. Let's go back. Let's, let's take that journey down into our hearts because um, that's where we need to go to really examine if we're in the light or if we're in darkness. Thank you, God. You know, I think some of you may be in a place where you feel disoriented and you feel like you're in darkness. And you feel like you don't know what's up, what's down, what's left or right and you're trying to feel your way around life and you find yourself tripping over the same rocks over and over again. And I know that the enemy is trying to tell you to stay there because it's safe, because nobody knows, because nobody understands. And I know he's trying to tell you that that's a safe place, but you know what, it's not. So I encourage you to realize that wherever you're at, that hiding is not security, but it isolates you. It isolates you from the God who is waiting for you. It isolates you from Jesus, the light of men who is waiting for you to step into his light. The beautiful thing is that when you step into the light and he sees you for what you really are and you come to that realization of who you really are, he still says, I love you. He doesn't say, all right, time to be perfect. It doesn't matter how ugly you feel. When you step into that light and you expose yourself, he says, I love you. And his light shines on you. I would just encourage you, I think you know if you're in that dark place that it's a false sense of security. I think deep inside you know that. And I think right now is the time to come to terms with that. And I love that during worship, we said, don't wait any longer to come back to God. 
don't wait. So I want to give you another opportunity to come into the light. Oh God, we just come before you. Lord, we want to come into your light. God, give us the courage. Give us the strength, Lord. God, I just pray for every single person here, Lord, and I, and I ask that you would just reassure them that it's okay to come. It's okay to be exposed. It's okay to confess. It's okay to be real. Lord, I pray that you would just encourage everyone here in that way. And Lord, just like your word says, we come together, Lord, in a fellowship. God, that's the way you designed it, that we're not alone in coming into the light. But when we step into the light, we discover that there's so much other people there. Lord, the people who are just waiting, who are begging us to come into the light so that they can help you. God, help us to take hold of our brothers and sisters here, the people around us. God, because we know that we were never meant to go through this life alone. So God, I ask that you would just light a fire of fellowship in this church. And if you're here and you don't know God, Maybe you don't know Jesus. Maybe this is the first time you've ever set foot in a place like this or you're hearing something like this. I just want to let you know that this light of men, this light is Jesus Christ, the one and only Son of God who came to earth, to, came, who came to us to save us so that we wouldn't have to reach for him. He came and he met us where we're at and although he's not here in the flesh anymore that principle still stands he will meet you where you're at it doesn't matter where you've been it doesn't matter how much you know or what you don't know he's going to meet you where you're at so if you want that if you want that freedom of forgiveness and the bible says that when we receive him we receive the greatest gift of all which is salvation which is eternal life after everything here is dead and gone we will go on with Jesus Christ and if you want that it, it does take a commitment it takes being exposed and being real but there is nothing more rewarding that you could ever do so if you want that today, I just encourage you to just come in agreement just to say this prayer under your breath. God, I come before you, Lord. And the best that I can in this moment, I surrender my life. God, I surrender control to you the control that I thought I had, but then now I know I didn't really have in the first place, God, but I give everything to you as my king, my ruler. Lord, and right now, I'm stepping into the light. I'm coming to you by saying that I am a sinner, that I have messed up, that I'm not perfect, and I know that I have offended you, that I have trespassed against you. God, I come before you humbly and I ask for your forgiveness. I ask that your forgiveness would just fall upon me. God, thank you so much I believe, I believe what your word says, that you came to earth, you sent your son, Jesus, 
to take away my sins because there was penalty for those. There was justice to be rendered, but Jesus did that for me on the cross when he died. Lord, I believe that the best that I can, even if I don't know all the details, I believe that the best that I can. And I believe that he rose again and that he's alive now and that he's the light of my life. Thank you, God. Thank you for your cleansing, for your forgiveness, and for this amazing gift of spending eternity with you. And I ask all of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.